one traumatizes these weirdly hot robots but me! Boring. And annoying. <laughs> Sorry! Just me in here. I think dumb things are freaking cool and I am So here we are at long last, at the finale for Murder Drones. Whew! What an episode. There is a ton to say about what transpired in the eighth and final episode. There was so much amazing action, some real genuine horror, some questions left up in the air, a lot of criticism to go around, and a lot to be rightfully praised. In this particular review, I'm going to have a look at just, first off, the general overall review of the events that transpired. I am going to have a look at the strengths and the weaknesses of this particular episode. And then, we're going to dive into a little bit of theory crafting. Because although this season, this show, this series is all wrapped up, there's some stuff to still dig into. After all, this is a Lovecraftian horror. And those of you who thought that we were through with this story, oh boy, you haven't seen anything yet. So once more, let's dive into Liam Vickers' great horror story alongside all of you novice authors. Hi there everyone, Lars here from Camille's Harem. Not just a podcast for novice writers by novice writers, but also a YouTube channel by novice writers for novice writers. Because writing is an adventure, it's more fun with friends. So for the general overview of the plot, Uzi is still up in space, she needs to get rescued, and she runs back into her mom. And good thing she was paying attention to N in the last episode, because this time she doesn't try to kick the little spider, but instead realizes, oh, we should try to have a little bit of a conversation. And while they're having a conversation to figure out what they need to do to destroy Sin once and for all, now that the patch is gone, boom, <laughs> and hits her with J Spaceship. I was not expecting this at all. I have been expecting that they were going to be teleported off to another planet that was then going to come and eat Copper 9, but apparently Sin is devouring Copper 9 from the inside out. Whatever weird, crazy space magic needed to be initiated for her to do this has been completed, and the planet is now being torn apart. Gravity is no more and all the different chunks are being pulled into this black hole of glowing gold. But not only that, there are tentacles going everywhere, destroying everything, pulling in the teacher who is just an absolute chad, and it's just like, look, I'm just done with all of this. I, whatever, I can survive. Good on you, teacher, you are a survivor. But, unfortunately for N and Uzi, Jay's spaceship is not a survivor and gets absolutely wrecked and torn apart and brought down. But luckily enough for them, their bodies, plus their clothes and their hair, are really good at resisting friction as they fly through the atmosphere and engage Sin in epic combat. Meanwhile, Jay's getting ready to murder Uzi's dad along with Thad and Lizzie, and then, lo and behold, I was right! Ha <laughs> ha! That V is not dead, and she comes galloping in on a Velociraptor. Yes! Oh, I approve so much! A crazy duel between the two of them ensues while the raptor turns on the worker drones and tries to devour them. And basically from this point on, all the side characters don't really matter as they're constantly avoiding getting eaten by the raptor. As V and J duke things out, we come to realize that J totally has known this entire time that she was working alongside Sin. We also know that V made her own agreement with Sin. An agreement that if they could annihilate this final planet, that Sin, aka Absolute Solver, would let her and N go, and that they could be together. 
Lo and behold, she has not forgotten their relationship back in the manor at all. And everything that she's been doing, even keeping him arm's length, has all been a part of her own plan, so that way they can survive and gallivant off into the horizon together. She is a hopeless romantic. Unfortunately, it's too late for her because now Uzi and N are dating. And this episode wants to make sure that you know that. Absolutely. I didn't know we're supposed to get away. Yeah, I'm kind of like actually mad about what you did. Um, before that wolf thing, we're like dating, right? Oh, yeah. Just like, cause I can't always, I plan. can't always yeah, read. Like... When Uzi and N arrive on the scene, throwing a black hole at another black hole, Absolute Solver is not necessarily cancelled out, but stalls in all of its destruction and machinations until it arrives in its host form, using Sin and Tessa, still as meat puppets and as robotic puppets, to grab Uzi's black hole and nullify it. And thus... The battle begins. Uzi, who's riding high on life and on power, I'm dating the guy that I like. She's ready to just take on Sin. Unfortunately, that's the wrong thing to do against an Eldritch Abomination because she and N get wrecked. And this is where you get just still some of the absolute best dialogue in the whole series. Why is it that the absolute most worst thing ever, this Eldritch Abomination, has the best lines in the entire series? Giggle, I am so naughty. The flesh demands invitation. Be first, eager beaver. <laughs> let me in, 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 let me in. Crisscross applesauce. Dropped this. Silly. Sheepish nod. Leg. Shuffle. 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 Oh, well timed. Giggle. And now we have to add to that collection this beautiful number. Hello, Uzi. I love how much is conveyed in this one moment alone, and I'll come back to just again the strengths of the writing here, but I just gotta gush and say for a moment that it's incredible how much personality is coming through in this one moment. The contempt, the hatred, the annoyance with Uzi that's just oozing off of Sin, and then when she turns and sees N, you get that spark of Sin and Tessa coming through via Absolute Solver's awful machinations. That, again, Absolute Solver doesn't actually care about N. It is manipulating him, it likes to torture him. We know by the end of this episode just how much Absolute Solver loves torturing this poor guy. But we see that genuine feelings that have been assimilated from Sin and from Tessa that are now a part of Absolute Solver shine through in this moment and it throws them at N, hoping to throw N off balance. But N is finally standing his ground, and again, this doesn't go over all too well for our heroes because they do get wrecked. Okay. Eager beaver. <laughs> let me in, 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 let me in. When Uzi pulls N's broken body away into this broken down building and tries to escape from Absolute Solver, we get just one of the best horror moments of the entire series. This feels like something right out of Alien at its best peak where sin realizes i can completely mess with you guys you can hide from me but i can pull out your horror i can pull out your greatest fears and you will react 
And an Uzi are able to stave off these machinations via the callback ping, callback ping. Unfortunately, V shows up after having trounced J for a little bit and begins looking for N. This is her last ditch effort to cut and run with the drone that she loves. Unfortunately, she runs into Sin. And then N, being the great guy that he is, the unchanging protagonist of the series, calls out to V to prevent her from getting killed. But this involves him getting his core ripped out, V getting caught, and it almost all ends in absolute tragedy until Uzi saves them. And then we get an excellent team up. This is what we should have been seeing earlier on in the series with these three drones really working together, trying to figure out their teamwork. So that way we could have had really a good solid foundation for this amazing fight because it is. I mean, it gets big with rockets flying, lasers going on, uh, plasma rifles, boom, slashing. <laughs> ah, it's just, oh, and I love how insane the choreography is. As a writer, this is the kind of chaos that I strive to emulate in my own writing. And this is where visual storytelling really has a leg up on simple prose because you can communicate the speed the intensity so much better Liam Vickers and his crew did an absolutely amazing job with this fight this is top tier quality this puts so much stuff that Hollywood's been cranking out recently to absolute shame and then at the height, the climax of this fight, right when it seems that Sin might be able to pull one last trick on Uzi and kill her, Uzi manages to turn around, put her hand right through Sin's chest, pulls out her core, and then burns it away with Absolute Solver. But then the entity, the actual entity of Absolute Solver itself is exposed. And as its vessel tries to eat it so that way it can take back in that power, Uzi eats the entity instead swallows it, destroys the vessel of Sin and Tessa, and she herself then dies. Only to wake up again and now be an absolutely damaged OC. And then we get a little bit of a flash forward. Things are now absolutely better. Yuzi has completed her hero's journey. Everything is great. She is dating and whoopee! And we then get the credits rolling. It's funny. It's heartwarming. Ships have sailed. Friendships are blossoming. Lots of great humor and horror playing out. And then we get this a little creepy scene at the very end. You look great. Mm. Have you considered a, a bow, though? And there you have it. That is the finale for Murder Drones. A lot of people were really upset that there was only 20 minutes of runtime to this episode when there were so many loose threads in the wind. What was all going to happen? What kind of great character development could be, de could be delivered in 20 minutes? And I'm going to get to that. But first, let's, let's focus a little bit here on the strengths. The action... Again, absolutely top notch. The action was flawless, it was seamless. Seriously, people could learn a whole lot from delving into what was done in this episode. And I will, I know I'm kind of like rambling a little bit right here, that's because I'm gonna save the best of my breakdown analysis of this fight for a future video. Because I will be there for probably 45 minutes talking about it because it is incredible what Liam Vickers did with this fight. Now then, the horror was also really great. The whole presentation of Absolute Solver, or coming through the storm, negating all of their abilities, hunting them through the hallway, how it spoke to V, V's reaction, how it dismembered character after character after character. No matter what they did, it kept on coming back, and then the really spooky moment where Uzi has to make a very fateful decision and swallow the entity. All of that was really good, edge of the seat, horror where you're like i have no idea what's gonna happen next please do not die please do not die and so 
many things happen to these characters. And at so many moments, even though you're like, no, 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 there's no way that, the ca that this character could die, I was left worrying whether V would die for good or whether N would die for good or whether Uzi would die for good. And that's because the atmosphere, the tone of this episode was set perfectly. The horror was on point right alongside the action. Also, this episode delivered everything that it needed to do for Uzi. Uzi has come completely full circle. As far as her hero's journey goes, it is complete. It was very well done. And as far as N goes, I was hoping for more, but ultimately, Liam decided to go for the unchanging protagonist. Basically, what this means is that a protagonist shows his or her strength by being true to who they are throughout the entire story. That no matter what happens to them, no matter what any other character or the world does, they cannot be brought down. And even though N is pushed to the absolute brink, to the absolute breaking moment throughout this episode with facing down uh, Sin in the storm and then in the hallway having to relive the moment where he was killed and assimilated into Absolute Solver and then looking at the woman that he loved, V, having just been torn apart moments before, before this sweet other little robot that he cared about as a little sister, Sin, is ripping him apart. And so that, that, that scene where she's literally tickling her way into his core, that was just a great callback. This is stuff that should have broken and, and we do get him saying like, oh, I'm a little bit mad with you, Uzi, for how you just tossed me away and decided to sacrifice yourself. But he still gets over his anger. He gets over his horror. He gets over his loss and his trauma and is there for his friends. And he still makes the absolute biggest end call by sacrificing himself to save V from Absolute Solver. And that is really incredible. Having the unchanging protagonist is actually something very hard to pull off because usually it makes the protagonist seem really dull and weak. And within anime and manga, that's usually covered up by giving the unchanging protagonist power after power after power, power up, level up. But N never gets any of that. So honestly, kudos to Liam for pulling off an unchanging protagonist who doesn't have to rely on power-ups to continue to be cool. And that's because he developed such a sweet, awesome cinnamon roll in N's character. And another strength is V. Absolutely. Because yes, of course, V would survive what happened with the Sentinels. Do we know how she did it? No. But of course we know that she was going to survive somehow. I had a whole list of reasons why she would survive. Turns out she's just super cool, beat all of them up, killed them all with her eyes closed, and decided that this would be a perfect opportunity to stab Sin in the back and try to escape with N, or at least pardon herself from everything that's going on and then be there to rescue and comfort N later on. She was playing her own 3D chess and I like that. I like that a whole lot. And then her anger against Jay, their conversation was done very well. And then we just get to see how awesome of a fighter she is, but we also get to see that softer side of her that's been hinted at since episode two. So everything came together for V, even though she loses out on her man, or does she? I'll get back to that here in a little bit. But those are honestly the strengths. The action, the horror, Uzi's character arc, N's character arc, and V's character arc. Everything came together really well for the core three and for just the general plot, what it needed to do, and the story living up to its status as a horror action comedy. But from there, the episode actually shows a ton of weaknesses. One of the weaknesses, right off the bat, is that the side characters who have been built up to have their own redemption arcs within Khan, Lizzie being the best friend that V needs, and Thad, who was dropped and then brought back because he obviously should have been, because he should have been a great complementary character to Uzi and End this entire time. They show up, they're supposed to have a great moment, and they get played off for a joke throughout the entire episode. Khan has one really cool moment, and Thad has a really cool moment, and Lizzie has a sweet moment, but other than that, they spend the entire time running away from the Sentinel. The first time I watched it, I was laughing. I was really enjoying myself. By the fourth time that I watched the finale, I actually got really annoyed and bugged because the potential 
in letting us see Khan be the dad that he needs to be, have a great epic redemptive moment. Thad being the cool guy who we always knew he was, showing that off once again like he did in the pilot episode. And just seeing more of Lizzie because she is an intelligent survivor. She hasn't gotten this far just because of good luck. It would have been great to see them contribute in their own small way, either to taking down Jay or helping to take down Absolute Solver in the grander scheme of things. Maybe even beating up the Raptor and then having the Sentinel as their buddy going forwards. But no, we didn't get any of that. And that was honestly very lame. And then with Jay, it's great to have Jay back. I was expecting a little redemption arc for Jay, and I'm I'm happy I got surprised. However, the thing is this, is that she then just got played off once again as a bit of a one-note character. And that's really disappointing because there's so much potential to Jay. So again, we have squandered potential for four separate characters. Then when we actually get to the end of the episode and we have everything that's playing on uh, with uh, the montage of things that happen once Absolute Solver's been defeated and then we have the death celebration for doll it was really lame to just be like okay so yeah doll died never mind everything that was being built up and done with that oh no 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 whatsoever and while i've seen a lot of people have some good fan conversations and theories about what we can take away from doll's arc the fact of the matter is she was basically killed off screen we have no idea really what she was doing or how she knew a lot of this stuff doll is ultimately a mystery and the problem is is that she's a mystery that was built up to be something grand then she's killed off and then just kind of forgotten overall and the finale itself even pokes fun at their own decision while it was funny the first time i watched again kind of like watching with con thad and lizzie it became kind of annoying upon rewatch because it's like wow thank you for reminding Reminding me that you squandered a really excellent mystery and opportunity within Doll. And another thing that I just I, I have to say, yeah, it did kind of grind on me over time. I like I'm totally fine with N and Uzi getting together. If you have followed any of my conversations about shipping within murder drones, N and Uzi was actually my first ship, and then later it became N and V. But I'm totally fine with N and Uzi getting together. They're a cute couple. There's a lot of great humor, a lot of great dialogue between them. And there's some great moments here in this episode. But the episode kept coming back to being like, we're together, we're together, we're together. And I'm like, I got that already. In fact, it's a whole lot better when they are working together and it's far more serious than than leaning into the cringe, than leaning into the silly because that did take a little bit away from the horror element and not in a way that provided much needed levity. Instead, it was more just like a, hey guys, this is the ship that sailed. We know it sailed. Show us how their relationship continues to progress from that point onwards. That is what makes a romance great and interesting. And so the shortened runtime definitely took away from the possibilities that could have been explored with these characters, as well as seriously developing the relationship between N and Uzi, even within the finale, which obviously very easily could have been done. The runtime, even with 20 minutes, is enough to still give characters some quick, great moments that would pop out out in your mind in your mind in your memory but really those moments were relocated to absolute solver n uzi and v and then some fun moments from jay but honestly people remember jay just because people like jay there's very little other than her admission to v that even she had been tricked that really pops out from her character in this episode con thad lizzie are very negligible. In fact, the teacher actually has greater moments than they do. And he is a tertiary character. He's a third-rate character within this entire series. So, yeah, that wasn't... Liam, that wasn't very great. And so what we get is an interesting conundrum. Because the pacing was perfect for wrapping up the story, for wrapping up the main character's character arcs, for delivering an amazing fight and some great horror, but because the story had gone out of its way to establish the importance of all these other side characters and to have all these other things that could have been answered to help wrap things up even better, the finale dropped all of that. And so it feels like there's a lot missing 
from this story. You really didn't need to add a whole lot. You could have easily have done this within a 22 to 25 minute runtime and have delivered everything that I've been griping could have been done better. But that's just not what we got. So again, the matter of pacing is always going to be one of the greatest enemies to any creator out there. Believe you me. But what would I say overall? I'd say overall, I really did enjoy this finale. I keep coming back to it again and again because it is so much fun to watch. However, its glaring mistakes and issues are there. And I'm not going to shy away from saying that. So what would I say? Am I going to say it's like, oh, this was an unfulfilling finale? To me, absolutely not. But I will say it's an imperfect finale. I will delve more into that when I do my retrospective for the entire series of Murder Drones. Yes, I'm going to go through all of it and talk about it in, in a cohesive whole as an author what was done well what was done wrong what can we learn by taking a big overview look at the entire series and how did liam vickers deliver in a way that hollywood hasn't in years because even with an imperfect finale to murder drones murder drones has done better than nearly any show or movie has in terms of quality storytelling that has come out of hollywood in at least half a decade. All right, so now let's shift gears and get into the theory crafting before we wrap things up. So remember this, this is a Lovecraftian horror story. And like any good horror story, you are left to interpret the ending. Horror stories usually don't give you all the answers. And if a horror story does, it's usually not doing a great job as a good horror story. Because a good horror story leaves you wondering what on earth is going on. It leaves you feeling creeped out unsettled and as you begin to delve more into the story to figure out why it's left you that way a horror story begins to become a mirror of you a mirror of the issues that the horror stories brought up or a mirror of the society that you live in that is what horror has always been purposed to do and a lovecraftian horror especially taps into those things that we fear the most so as a result of that, we are left wondering what is actually going on with Uzi and with the entirety of Copper 9 by the end of the episode. So allow me to offer to you three different interpretations, one which is good, one which is kind of bad, kind of good, depends on how you want to take it, and then the other, in my opinion, is truly Lovecraftian. So, my very first interpretation is this. Uzi, as the damaged OC, did indeed succeed in defeating Sin and has completely assimilated the Absolute Solver into herself. And what we see there at the end with the shattered mirror and even with the hologram and everything like that is that this is unfortunately the broken side effects of being the hero, of beating Absolute Solver but she has won. She has assimilated all of that into herself, but she now has to live with Absolute Solver as a constant annoying companion who wants her to dress more like Tessa. So there you have it. Uzi has won. Everything that you see is face value. Everything is hunky-dory happy, except for the fact that there is still this monster hanging around with Uzi. And what we can interpret this as is that even though you can be the hero and be absolutely awesome and save the day, complete your hero's journey, it's that you can still have terrible consequences from your choices. The trauma, the anxiety, the loss, just the things that those kinds of horrors and action do to us on a psychological level is very real. And so even though you're done with that part of your adventure, that those horrors still stick with you and are something that you will have to constantly be dealing with for the rest of your life and as such it's a very realistic message to give but because uzi is dealing with it in her own uzi way it's an incredibly positive message however the second interpretation is a little bit more yeesh 
So in this particular case, Uzi did win. Everything as we saw it transpire did indeed happen. However, she isn't truly winning in the end. By absorbing Absolute Solver into herself, which is an amalgamation of all these different lives and worlds that has devoured over time, those personalities, all of that information and everything is now in her. It's too much for one little worker drone. As such, she's beginning to become corrupted. She is turning into that monster. When we look at the cracked mirror and the hologram, and then the tail speaking to her, and then putting on Tessa's bow, Uzi is losing. You can see it in her face, how drawn she is. She isn't annoyed, she's exhausted. She's breaking down. And all of those other entities, all of those other minds and memories and knowledge, all wrapped up in Absolute Solver itself, is beginning to come out and she is becoming a monster and so just like with the first interpretation sometimes the things that we go through change us forever and sometimes it's not for the better sometimes the real monsters truly are the ones within us now then here's the third interpretation and this is where we start traversing a little bit more into theory crafting but please do bear with me uzi is dead ish not completely dead but she is gone she's out of the picture when she absorbs absolute solver into herself if you go frame by frame for as she starts collapsing in on herself right before we get the fatal error message across her screen we see that all of her programs are talking about fleeing escaping and deleting something is happening within uzi she's fighting against whatever it is that she's taken into herself absolute solver is an eldritch abomination deity god something it is far more than just some murder drone that's possessing a young girl's corpse it is so much more uzi has no idea what she's dealing with but she has eaten it she has beaten it she has reduced it to its most base form, allowing her to take it into herself. But doing so killed her. Everything that we see after her screen goes blank, to her being revived and everything's all great, that's all playing out in her head. Uzi is stuck within herself. She's dead ish this is a sacrifice everything that we've seen everything that we're seeing playing out is all in her head as she tries to keep absolute solver from breaking out remember this absolute solver merges with other entities with other beings it tries to consume them itself but in this case it was what was being consumed but this is an eldritch god of some kind it will not go down easy as such Uzi is locked away in a nightmare, in a beautiful nightmare. Everything is great. She's dating N, everyone loves her now. The world has been brought back together. She's getting an A in class. Her dad loves her to the point where it's obnoxious. He's been reunited with her mother, Nori. Everything is wonderful. But then again, that ending, it's not right. It's an illusion. That is what the mirror is telling us. It's all just an illusion. Remember how she looks around and there's no one there, but every, in all the other images, she's there, like everyone else is there. She's surrounded by all the people that she loves, but in that hallway, she's alone. Because ultimately, in her own head, it's just Uzi and Absolute Solver together. And she has to suppress this thing because if she loses control, absolute solver will come back through her now then it gets built up even a little bit more from there because like i said she's dead ish she is a vessel containing absolute solver nori who has access to absolute solver's powers will probably be able to recognize well what's going on here we'll understand that they've got to do something to help out her daughter but how do you plug in to a drone who is dead ish that's going to take some time, especially after the planet has just been absolutely wrecked. And so, there is another story that is playing out very likely outside of Uzi's knowledge, where N, V, Nori, Khan, and everyone else are trying to rebuild the world and are trying to reach out to her, bring her back. But can they actually do that? And here's the reason why I believe that this is very likely what's going on. Maybe I am stretching this a little bit too far, but remember, this is a Lovecraftian horror story. What do these characters all fear? Say, V 
wants N. That's what she wants. But N is now d dating Uzi, but he can't date Uzi because Uzi is a deadish vessel for Absolute Solver, who will one day threaten to break out very easily could if Uzi ever loses control. And so V has N, but can't actually have him. N can't have Uzi. So where is that going to go? Could N and V end up together again? Who knows? But that is an existential crisis for the two of them. Khan and Nori are reunited. Hooray! But it's not as a happy family because they're missing their daughter. But then again, the planet is wrecked. Where do you go from there? And again, that's another reason why I believe that this is all actually happening inside Uzi's head because the planet was very well broken up and just demolished. And yet, seems in all of the other imagery that we get that things are hunky-dory. Would it really be that way? Hmm. I think it's far more likely, once again, that we have a true Lovecraftian ending, which is never tr which is never a happy ending. This is about the happiest that it can get. Everyone has survived to some degree or another, but they're separate. Their world is broken. Things might be worse than ever before, and now they've got to figure out a new way to move on. And so I leave it up to you as the audience to choose which interpretation do you go with. Again, I go with the third interpretation because to me that smacks way more of a Lovecraftian ending than any of the others. And it allows Uzi to maintain her heroic arc, which I will point out this other little detail. The hero's journey is cracked when she shows it. It's different than what she had shown before in the very first episode. She's completed her journey, but there's a break in it. It's not truly complete. She is the hero of her own story, but she's damned within her own mind as a deadish vessel trying to hold back Absolute Solver. Meanwhile, who knows what other kinds of possibilities could be had for these characters. If you wanted to continue on the story of murder drones, this one opens up all different kinds of possibilities because you can have the dreamland, all the happiness and whatnot that's going on with Uzi with that creeping dread of Absolute Solver manifesting itself more and more as her dreams slowly become more nightmarish. Meanwhile, on the outside, how is everyone trying to reach out to Uzi? How are their relationships progressing without her being immediately there? What kinds of other fun shipping teases can we have? Mm-hmm. <laughs> The third option, in my opinion, opens up the door for way more things to happen. It should Murder Drones ever be continued, which it likely won't be beyond whatever they do at the Glitch Inn, which is going to be awesome, I have no doubt. But if you really wanted to continue on the story and stay true to its Lovecraftian roots, I believe that the third interpretation is the way to go. Now, to wrap it all up, what can we as novice authors learn from this imperfect finale? Number one, endings are hard. They really are hard to pull off. And you actually don't have to answer every single question or wrap up every single thread. You honestly don't. What you do want to do is you do want to wrap up everything that you have set up. You want to provide that special payoff. And you want to make sure that every important character has completed an important part of their character arc, if not having completed everything that they should have done, everything that you had planned for them to do. And that's one of the reasons why, again, it's really frustrating that Khan, Lizzie, and Thad, and to a certain extent Jay, are kind of left off to the side, while Uzi, N, and V, of course, just get some brilliant character development and some great moments in this finale, which is great, but it would have been amazing it had all the characters who had been participants gotten their own special moment to wrap everything up. So, not having too many loose threads, setting up all the important stuff that you had, that you had set up, actually paying that off, and making sure that all of the important characters that you've brought into this finale that their stories conclude in a satisfying way. Now, there will definitely be a whole lot more to say when I do my retrospective of the entire series, plus when I do my ultimate breakdown of this fight scene, I'm gonna praise it up and down, but there are also some other little mistakes along the way that Liam could have avoided if, if, he maybe had split season one into two seasons with a whole lot more character development and world building being done in the first half of Murder Drones. That, that honestly, I think, could have been the solution to all of this. Rather than having eight episodes, maybe 16 episodes, with episode four of Murder Drones being the end of a first season, and then 
episode five maybe being the crazy opening to a much darker more intense second season which really just brings everything to a head in one crazy week where the world ends i think that that would have done i think that that would have been really really great uh but yeah that's just uh, that's my that's my review my analysis my thoughts and critique here on the finale and now that i've pontificated enough about murder drones i want to hear your thoughts your opinions especially on my interpretations of the ending and my theory about the true lovecraftian ending that probably has just been dished out to us have I, have I gone too far afield or am I spot on? What are your theories about what's really going on at the end of Murder Drones Episode 8? And always remember this, that even if we don't get a second season of Murder Drones, we always have fan fiction. Beautiful, glorious fan fiction. Ha <laughs> ha! A great way to practice your own writing. And with all that being said, thank you so much for joining us on this incredible, sometimes haunting, journey that we call writing. And until the next video, y'all, Choose. Also, now I can do this! Ah!